Okay, so good morning. We're going to start. Um, my name is Kila. I am from biology. I'm an electrophysiologist, so I pretty much deal with tachycardias. So it turns out that maternal mortality has gone up over the past 10 years or so. And one of the things that people quote is that arrhythmias and cardiac disease in maternity increase mortality. So it is a big deal that we have an approach to maternal tachycardia and have an idea that is it truly a tachycardia and if it is a tachycardia, what are the possible causes? So Gerald is just gonna really give us an overview on how to approach this problem. Thank you so much. Thanks, Peter. Um... For those of you who don't know Dr. Mkoko, he is our EP specialist. I think it's a testament to cardiology department that we have him here. I call on him a lot because we have a lot of tachycardias and other arrhythmias, as I will show you. So I'm just going to start off with why this is important. So as you mentioned, maternal mortality, um, it's better, but it's not great. This is the, if you look at the, the colored bars, there's the four major causes of maternal mortality with non-pregnancy related infections being number one. Um, followed by hypertensive disorders, obstetric hemorrhage, and then medical and surgical disorders, which are mostly cardiac and respiratory issues. But if you have a look here, it doesn't project very well, but um, those six that I've highlighted are all things that can present with a tachycardia. Um, so ectopic pregnancy from bleeding, uh, pregnancy-related sepsis, and then um, embolism as also pulmonary embolism. And you throw a miscarriage into the mix as well, 71% of deaths from miscarriage are due to sepsis, 20% are due to hemorrhage, so those can also definitely present the tachycardia. And then I don't think anyone will disagree that adverse drug reactions and acute collapse, which is probably due to PEs, um, can also present the tachycardia. So the nine of the 13 top causes of maternal death can all present the tachycardia. And that's the reason we get so many consults for tachycardia in pregnancy. The other problem is, is if you look at the potentially preventable maternal deaths in that first column over there, so this is all maternal deaths, 62.4% of deaths in pregnancy in South Africa were potentially preventable in the most recent confidential inquiry. And they highlight one thing in the, you know, the causes that can be avoided. And one of them is that patients are discharged home from postnatal wards of the tachycardia, and then they come back with sepsis, with anemia, with something else that ends up killing these patients. And this was raised in an article in the SAMJ, uh, came out in May last year by Moran and colleagues, um, and they highlighted a couple of things. So the one is that, you know, these regular audits and confidential inquiries, inquiries have highlighted the importance of investigating a persistent tachycardia. There are many possible causes um, listed there, and as I've mentioned, um, and they make a statement that you should not send a pregnant or postpartum woman home while she has a persistent tachy. And they use a value of 110. And I'll go into that in a bit more detail now. And they say, if the cause is not clear, do further investigations as required, um, which we'll also go into. So I've got four cases just to um, go through. These are all cases we saw on our service. Um, starting with case one is a 21-year-old primigravid at 30 weeks. Only history is that she's HIV positive, but she is virally suppressed. So not much going on there. Second case is also a 21-year-old primigravida at 11 weeks. She had no medical history. Uh, the third case is a 20-year-old gravida 2 at 38 weeks. She had previous epilepsy, but she'd been off treatment for three years. Um, she'd been weaned off treatment and doing well. And the fourth case, another primigravida at 28 weeks with no medical history. And the same thing for these four very different patients. Please, can you see this patient for a persistent tachycardia? So the first patient presented with presyncope and palpitations. The second one with palpitations and vomiting. Third patient with fever and back pain. And then the fourth patient just had a persistent tachy at routine visits. So to go into each of the cases, so the first case, this first primigravida, her symptoms started prior to pregnancy, um, worsened in the second trimester. Her exam was unremarkable, except for this persistent sinus tachy around about 120. Bloods were all normal, but we asked and begged, and then we finally got an ECG. And this is what it looked like. I don't know if you can see it. Probably if you're online, you can see it a bit better than in the room. But if you if you zoom in over there, I think you can notice that very short PR interval in lead two with that upsloping QRS and V5 as well. So she had Wolf Parkinson White. All right. Second case. 
Theoretic history of vomiting, mood swings, according to the patient, um, and palpitations. She had a goiter, no thyroid eye signs. Everything was normal except for her thyroid functions. So as much as she was vomiting, we thought this might be a hyperemesis. That T4 is a bit out of keeping. We didn't actually have a beta HCG for her, but the decision was that she had hypothyroidism. Uh, we're still waiting for her antibodies, but she's likely at Graves. And we started her um, in discussion with endocrine and some neomercosol um, to treat these symptoms. Third case, had multiple UTIs in the current pregnancy. She came across from Edenvale. Uh, she had dysuria, a bit of back pain, and then these paroxysmal episodes of tachycardia. And renal angle tendons on examination. You can see your inflammatory markers there. And she had a proteus mirabilis on both blood and urine. And she was a sepsis, a patient of sepsis due to a UTI. She actually had runs of tachycardia up to about 180 beats per minute, which all settled with the start with starting antibiotic, appropriate antibiotics, and getting the sepsis under control. And the final case, um, she had tachycardia noted at a routine follow-up on two occasions, pulse rate about 106 to 110, but completely asymptomatic. Exam was normal, all those bloods were normal, her ECG was normal. And after much debate and assessment, it was decided she is likely a physiological tachycardia or pregnancy. So four different cases, four very different causes of a tachycardia. And if you throw in some extra causes here, so pain, PE, anxiety, anemia, along with those four, the idea of this question is, what the hell is the cause of this tachycardia in a lot of patients? And what's the necessary workup for these patients? Mm -hmm. So you need to ask yourself, firstly, what's normal in a pregnant patient? So this article from 1907 in the BMJ, um, I, I highlighted just to show you how advanced they were. They had an obstetric physician back in 1907. Um, we're getting there. But Dr. Blacker was a bit off the mark. Uh, there are no changes met with in the pulse of pregnant women. And then just to show how much more off the mark he was, he decided, if you look at that bottom one, that, um, or if you look at the top there, uh, first half of pregnancy, nothing happens with the blood pressure, then it goes up. And at the bottom, uh, sometimes the heart hypertrophies, sometimes it dilates and hypertrophies, and sometimes it doesn't do anything. So not much on the money there, but at least they were looking back in 1907. Then in 1959, this article from Disease Amount, which is a real journal, which I stumbled across, and it's quite interesting, actually, um, if you have a look at it. They wrote this review, and they said during pregnancy, resting heart rate goes up about 10 beats per minute, reaching a peak in the eighth lunar month. Carruth and colleagues then did something quite interesting in 1981. They took 102 patients. They took their uh, pulse uh, they did an ECG in each of the trimesters and then at delivery and then in the postpartum period. And what you can see there, they used postpartum as base, or they considered postpartum as the baseline. And so the pulse went up from 66 to 87. Uh, so it's a 21 beats per minute um, increase, a 32% increase. And this is a really interesting study uh, from 2014. They took 54 women from preconception that were um, planning a pregnancy. They then monitored them weekly for ovulation and then to see once they had conceived. And so they took pulse rates from six weeks uh, and then during and then postpartum. And similar to that previous study, a pre-pregnancy heart rate of 68, going up to 80 by the third trimester, so about 12 beats per minute, which is a 20% increase. And again, 10 to 20 beats, 20 to 25%. And again, just to um, cement it all, this is from the Handbook of Obstetric Medicine, heart rate goes up 10 to 20 beats per minute. So really, up until 2020 was accepted. This is what the heart rate does. It goes up um, by 10 to 20 beats per minute. But then Lisa Lurup and colleagues, a bunch of rabble rousers, went and did a systematic review. They took 39 studies, uh, 10,900 heart rate measurements from 8,300 women. And they showed this um, rather interesting slide or graph. And if you look at the, just look at the um, uh, scale on the side here, so it's going, only going up by five beats per minute increments. And you can see here, the heart rate really only increased by 7.6 beats um, throughout pregnancy. Um, so they said, hold on, maybe we're getting this whole 10 to 20 beats per minute, this 20 to 25% thing wrong. So the same group then did this study, which has been quoted quite a lot recently. They did the pulse rates, blood pressures, sets, respiratory rates, everything in a thousand women. And they showed something pretty similar for heart rate that your heart rate doesn't go up by more than about eight to 10 beats per minute. And so the question is, is 120 beats per minute too high as your maximum heart rate in pregnancy? And the NHS has actually adopted this. Um, this, was, this is a draft that they have in process. Uh, it was uh, given to me by Anita Banerjee 
She's uh, obstetric physician at Guy's and Thomas's. But what they are going to change their system to is they are going to say that you really should start worrying when the pulse is above 113 and up during pregnancy and definitely worry when it's more than a, or equal to 122. And then postpartum 100, 108, you really start worrying. There is no South African data on this. There's no African data on this. So we really don't know what is normal in our setting. We should probably be looking at that. So the approach to a tachycardia in pregnancy, and I think for the regs, um, especially when you're at Barrow, you're going to get called 500 times on your day three cover to come and see a tachycardic patient. And a lot of the time you think, is this really necessary? Do I need to do this? But I've shown you those mortality stats and why you should do it. So don't delay, just plan your life and go across and see your consult. So your first question to ask is, is this patient stable? If they're not, you're going to follow your ACLS principles. I think everyone knows this slide, especially those doing their part ones and their ACLS. But if you have a persistent tachyarrhythmia, it's not causing symptoms, but you do have, and you don't have a wide QRS, go with your vagal maneuvers, denosine, beta blocker, and then expert consultations, when you call Dr. Nkoko, to see the patients. This is from the ESC guideline on supraventricular tachycardia, and they have a section on pregnancy. And they say class one evidence is vagal maneuvers and adenosine. Class two evidence would be your beta blocker. And the reason for that is, if you have a look here, this is a review that was done, looked at all the cases um, and how they, and the summary of interventions. And your adenosine has the best um, restoration rate, 84% versus beta blockers of 38%, and also greater success without an adverse outcome, 63% versus 38%. So you can see quite a lot of adverse outcomes there with beta blockers and your drug. If you have a wide QRS, you're going to give adenosine or another antiarrhythmic infusion. These are all the antiarrhythmics they looked at in that trial. A lot of them we don't have, but varying rates of success from 84% with adenosine all the way down to 25% with quinidine. I don't think we have disopyramide, which is 20%. And then if your patient is unstable, hypotension and so on, synchronized cardioversion. So a question that's asked a lot is, can you shock a pregnant patient? Or should you shock a pregnant patient? And really, yes, you should. So if you have any tachycardia or hemodynamic instability, please cardiovert that, electrically cardiovert that patient. It's safe in all stages of pregnancy. It doesn't compromise fetal blood flow and has a low risk of inducing fetal arrhythmias um, or initiating preterm labor. And really, something I always say is that if you don't have a mother, you don't have a baby. So if she's going to die from her um, unstable rhythm, then you've got to do something so that you can save her and all the baby. So heading back then, once your patient's stable, something that's really important to always ask is, is this patient in pain or is this patient anxious? So we'll often see a patient who's just had a seizure and does she have post -op, um, adequate post-op analgesia? You know, we've started using PCIs here, which is quite nice, and we're seeing a lot less um, post-operative post pain in obstetric high care here. But also, you know, was in episiotomy, did she have a tear? Is there ad adequate analgesia for this? And I can't emphasize enough um, we take for granted that a CESA is major abdominal surgery. And, you know, if someone has an appendicectomy, you expect them to not get out of bed for a day or two and you take it easy. But with a CESA, I think anyone who's had one will tell you that within six hours, as soon as your legs are working, you're up out of bed. So don't forget pain. And then don't forget anxiety. Has mom been separated from her baby? Is baby sitting up in ICU and she's alone, doesn't know what's going on? Um, was she lying in high care? The grand ward rounds just come past and everyone stared at her and poked at her. Um, so. If that's the case, treat it appropriately. If not, do an ECG, but actually just do an ECG always because you're going to miss something like that Wolf Parkinson White. She might have pain, but she might have an underlying arrhythmia. If that ECG is a patient in sinus rhythm, if not, what is the rhythm? AF, SVT, VTAC, ATAC, and manage that appropriately. The reason it's important to manage this is this study was actually amazing. It's from one of these um, Swedish registries, as far as I remember, but they had 57 million pregnancy-related hospitalizations between 2000 and 2012. And they showed that the overall frequency of arrhythmias was 68 um, per 100,000. If you have a look at any arrhythmia, this averages out to 68. Um, and importantly, death due to any arrhythmia was 5.9% as opposed to 0% um, from all hospitalizations just because they had 57 million patients. They couldn't put that decimal point far enough, so just called it zero. And then maternal and fetal complications from any arrhythmia, 36.5% versus 21% um, from all hospitalizations. So really, if there is an arrhythmia, 
patients are more likely to die and they are more likely to complicate, which is why we should look for it and treat it appropriately. If the patient's in sinus rhythm, you need to start asking, are there any other abnormal features? So is there an S1, Q3, T3, or features of RV strain? So are we dealing with a PE here? Um, is there LV hypertrophy? Is the patient you know, in heart failure, um, which is more of a clinical thing, but is there something abnormal on the ECG? And then should you image the patient? And that can be anything from an echo at the bedside to a CTPA or a VQ scan, which are both safe in pregnancy. I'm not going to talk more about that now. If there's no abnormal features, then you're really starting to scrape the barrel. But consider your, your clinical exam history. I've put it here. You should do it at the start and throughout the process, but it works well on an algorithm to put it here. So is there pallor or bleeding? Uh, speaks for itself. Are there signs of infection? Does she have a pneumonia? Is there a UTI on board? Is that Caesar wound three days post? Is there pus coming from that? And there's a septic gap. Are there signs of a PE? So is there dyspnea as well, in addition to this tachycardia? Or is the patient in heart failure? You know, she's got orthopnea, PND, and these massively swollen legs, and she's got this tachy at the same time. So really you're asking yourself, what company does this tachycardia keep? In terms of blood tests, hemoglobin, again, looking for the anemia, thyroid functions, as you saw in that case, um, your inflammatory markers, and then blood cultures, urine, anything else that's appropriate. And then a pro-BNP is also really useful. Um, there are pregnancy-specific cutoffs that you can use, but it also does help you decide, does this patient need an echo or not? So if all of that is normal, then you're really scraping, scraping the barrel. You've got to ask, are you dealing with something else? So drugs, methamphetamines. We saw a patient recently who was using methamphetamines during pregnancy. She had a tachycardia. Um, caffeine, another patient we saw was drinking five or six cups of tea a day. Um, so that caffeine was driving her tachycardia, which settled as soon as she stopped doing that. And then anxiety, other psychiatric disorders you need to ask about. And then finally, is this a paroxysmal tachycardia? So does it come and go? Does it cause symptoms? In which case you're going to go onto your 24 hour ECG, um, which we've done quite a few for recently. And we've picked up some weird and wonderful arrhythmias on our pulses. So that's the complete algorithm. It's a nice approach to take if you're called to see a patient with tachycardia. Um, it goes through most of the major causes. So I'm just going to finish up. It's a nice and quick talk this morning. The question is, when should you worry? So really antenatally, if the heart rate's above 110 or postnatally above 100, I would walk across to see the patient. But I would do it, you know, what? Once they've called you, take a walk. If it's above 120 or above 110, I would walk fast or run. Physicians don't run unless they are patients hypoglycemic, but if your heart rate's that high, go across. So to summarize, uh, tachycardia may be the presenting symptom in most of the leading causes of maternal death. Don't delay in seeing a patient. We need to establish referral networks between obstetrics and internal medicine to um, help manage these patients appropriately. I'm gonna leave you with this. This is from the UK's uh, confidential inquiries in 2021. They say, uh, treat women who may become pregnant, are pregnant, or have recently been pregnant, the same as a non-pregnant person, unless there's a very clear reason not to. And so when you're at the bedside of a pregnant woman with a tachycardia or any condition, ask yourself, how would I treat this patient if she was not pregnant? Or even better, ask yourself, how would I treat this patient if she was a man? And see if that changes your approach and if you want to do something else. But just to highlight what we need to do is train postgrads um, to recognize the abnormal, work as a multidisciplinary team, as I think we've been doing really well between obstetrics, us, and cardiology uh, to pick up these cases, and then with the other units for other cases. And then finally, stop gatekeeping. I think this is something that's so important. When you get that phone call, you are being called for a reason. Um, you know, as the med reg, as a physician, you have the expertise in managing these conditions, and that's why you're being called, just as we call other specialties um, for their expertise. And really, that is tachycardia in a nutshell. I'm not sure if there are any questions.